And uh, as our teens are exiting tonight, um, thank you for those of you who prayed for them and their trip to camp. And uh, Lord willing, soon we'll hear a few testimonies, I'm sure, from that trip. But they're grateful for what God's doing in our young people and they're looking for what God has for us tonight. Psalm 119, let's pick up in verse 81 tonight, is where we'll be this evening. Uh, these next two stanzas in our study of this rich uh, uh, psalm and uh, its celebration of God's word. Psalm 119, and let's begin in verse 81. Would you join me in standing for a moment if you're able to do so tonight? Psalm 119, and being sleepy is not an excuse to stay seated. So that means you need to stand probably more than normal. So Psalm 119, let's begin in verse uh, number 81, and we're going to read down through verse 96. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but, hope in thy, but I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. How many are the days of thy servant when thou wilt ex execute judgment on them that persecute me? The proud have digged pits for me which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully, help thou me. They had also consumed me upon the earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me, verse 88, after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep thy, the testimony of thy mouth. Verse 89, forever, and this is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for, the, for all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delight, I should have perished in mine affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. Verse 94, I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. Verse 96, I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandments, yeah, thy commandment is exceeding broad. And so we're looking at tonight celebrating the sustenance of God's word, as well as the eternality or the enduring qualities of the word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the joy it is to be here again this evening. Thank you for what you're doing in our midst, how you moved and worked in hearts. Thank you for how you especially used uh, the reps from uh, West Coast this morning and all of the songs and lyrics and, and melodies, Lord, harmonies that allowed us to appreciate you and your provision and your presence in our lives. And thank you for this day as we uh, recognize our dads and affirm them and tried to encourage them, and I pray that that happened this morning. We pray now tonight as we enter again this precious psalm that, Lord, you would convince us that where we are not in right relationship with your word, we're missing out on so much. And I pray that each of us, our relationship with your word would be deepened and strengthened and motivated uh, as we again revisit this text tonight. Bless this study, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Um, I remember when Heidi and I, uh, when I proposed to my wife and some of the build up to that, uh, the key was that I had a ring that was heavy enough and big enough and whatever to convince her to, you know, take a flyer on yours truly. Uh, and so I remember kind of the dynamics of that. And, and we talked a bit about her preferences on ring. I'm not a complete idiot. So I asked her opinion or what she preferred. But gold is a very precious metal. And I was reading and studying about this recently. Again, I'm familiar with gold. I, have, I don't have lots of it, but I'm aware of the, the element. But I don't know if I've thought of this before. Why doesn't gold corrode? Why is it so corrosive, retardant, or resistant? And one of the main reasons is not what is in gold, but what is not in gold, uh, which is the element iron. Um, and I was reading on this, and just a summary of it, the, one of the articles I was reading said this, gold is the most non-reactive of all metals and is benign in all natural and industrial environments. Gold never reacts with oxygen, one of the most active elements, which means it will not rust. And at most, gold will tarnish. I don't know if you've had like a, something gold that after a number of years, you may get a, a slight tarnish, but it's easy to take away. There's very little in gold that can uh, corrode. And so with that analogy in mind, as we look at these two uh, stanzas of Psalm 119, and again, we're now into the next two letters of the alphabet uh, as we'll get to here in verse 81 and in verse 89, uh, is the treasure, the enduring uh, treasure of uh, God's Word. And can I just remind us tonight, the only thing on planet Earth that will not corrode or rust away as the years go by is the gold of God's Word. 
Um, and I will tell you, that's probably been one of the, the best uh, gifts that God has renewed in my mind over these last few months, is just how precious uh, and how permanent the Word of God is. Um, I don't know about you, but my, my social media feeds, my news, uh, like there's so much that's been said over the last couple of years that's just, it, it, it's just stupid. You know, it's just, it's, 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 it's short-sighted at best, and it is foolishness uh, at worst, and I'm thankful for the Word of God that gives to us something that is enduring. So the question tonight is this, in a day where everything is running thin or running out, how do we rely more upon the enduring treasure or value that we find in the Word of God? And so let's break these down tonight, these two blessings that come to us through the Word of God. Number one, for a few minutes, first of all, let's talk about the celebrated sustenance that's referenced here in uh, stanza cough is the word or the letter here that now uh, each of these verses will begin with that letter. And so in the midst of all of this darkness and despair, notice the sustenance that the psalmist derives from the word of God. All right, let me give you a couple things on your outline there tonight. Uh, I gave you all of the sub points just so we can work through each of these verses tonight. Number one, be biblical with pursued sustenance. Be biblical, be like God, be in line with God, by pursuing his sustenance. Um, I don't know if today's Father's Day, and I don't know if you, you ladies out there and your kids have ever tried to pull one, a fast one, and your husband, the dad of the house, you know, to joke him or to mess with him. Um, but uh, and a lot of times it involves like maintenance issues. Dad, we just broke this, and then we broke that. You know, he gets home from work, and you start going through the scenario of this, this story that you've concocted together. Um, the other day, a friend of mine who's a missionary... Uh, his wife posted this. Here was the, I'll show you the picture in a minute. But the son came running into the room. His dad's like reclining. He just got home from work. And uh, their son, <laughs> Joshua, came around the corner yelling, saying that water was running down the stairs. Now, I don't know what you dads would think, but I'd be like, okay, who overflowed the tub or what happened? And then here's, here's the picture she took of her son. <laughs> The water is running down the stairs. And the, he came around the corner, probably not calmly whistling. He probably was like worked up. And then he just, you guys, you know, you got me. Water's running down the stairs. Um, can I say to you tonight, as it relates to the Word of God, we need the Bible. We need what it provides for us because we're not on a playground tonight. We're, this isn't fun and games. We're, we're in a battle for survival. We're in a battle for the glory and honor of God, the battle for souls. And if if we recognize tonight that we can't make it without God, then that means we have got to seek, we've got to pursue what he provides in his word. And I think, to be honest with you, many of us are blaming God for lacking in our lives that's really the, the consequence of us not seeking him in his word. Uh, so I hope these next few verses will challenge your thinking on that. Stop wishing God would make a move. Seek him, pursue him in his word. Let him give you those answers, give you that clarity, give you even that conviction uh, that you and I both need. All right, so let's break down these texts, these verses quickly tonight. Number one, hold on to the hope in God's word with your soul. Go back to verse 81. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Hold on to the hope in God's word with your soul. The soul. The Bible is not meant to just be something that appeals to our head or stimulates thoughts or even moves us emotionally in a, in a sense that's just on a, a surface or a shallow level. It's meant to connect with our soul. God, who is a spirit, longs to connect with us on a soul level. And so hold on to the hope that's found in God's Word. Hold on to it with your very soul. We sense the songwriter here is overwhelmed. Do you see that? He says, my soul fainteth. He's longing. He needs God to show up. And it, it drives him in one direction. It drives him to God's word, which gives to him hope. It's scary for me to even say this tonight, but is this not true in principle? Anything that drives us to the word of God is a good thing. Yeah. Isn't it? And if the Word of God is the primary purpose and function and, and drive of our lives, then really the circumstances that go on in our life are really just a gift to drive us, to move us, to lean into the Word of God. And so look uh, to hold to the Word of God uh, to give you that hope that it alone brings. All right, verse 82. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, when wilt thou comfort me? Number two, look for comfort in God's Word with your eyes. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, when wilt thou comfort me? Look for comfort in God's word with your eyes. Um, it's amazing to me how much we refer to the word, 
we post about the Word, we kind of paraphrase the Word, but we don't take our eyeballs and look at the Word. And the reason we're not where we should be on the comfort level is because we're not letting God personally and intimately comfort us directly. And the way to avail ourselves of that comfort is to say, I'm going to take my eyes with all the distractions and all the other things I could look at and scan and, and swipe across. I'm going to go to God's Word uh, with my eyes. So look for comfort in God's Word uh, with your eyes. And so we see the psalmist doing that. Even though his eyes have grown dim with searching for the fulfillment of God's promised deliverance, I love how he says, <laughs> says this. Look back at verse 82. When wilt thou comfort me? Not will you comfort me. He says when. So it just, I got to wait long enough and I'm going to keep in your word. I'm just going to keep waiting on you until uh, you provide that comfort. It was not a question of would God comfort him. It was simply when. And he chose to wait by keeping his eyes in God's word. And this idea of waiting and fainting, seasoned believers know that that's a, that's a growing thing. When I'm waiting and I'm fainting, but I'm still in God's Word, it's a stretching thing, it's a challenging thing, and, and we, we challenge ourselves and we encourage ourselves by looking to the Word. All right, verse 83, for I am become like a bottle in the smoke. We'll unpack that metaphor in just a moment. I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. Thirdly, jot, jot this down under our pursuit of God's sustenance, remember God's renewing word for usefulness. Remember God's renewing word for usefulness. Are you guys ever just blown away with your own, like, just ignorance? Maybe this is just me, but you're just, you're kind of, you know, it just kind of sneaks up on you sometimes. I was just tonight getting, trying to come in here for the service, and you know what a breast strip is? Do you know what I mean by that? Those little, it's like Listerine type, you know what I'm talking, you guys are kind of looking at me like you know what I'm talking about. And, and I was trying to put one in my mouth real quick because I had everything else and so I, and I missed my mouth and it kind of just wrapped around my upper lip. <laughs> and I was trying to get it off my lip before it dissolved and I had like this green, bluish green residue as I came out tonight. I didn't have time to wipe it off, but I basically missed my mouth. Do you ever feel like your mouth just is a little uncoordinated, not just in what it takes in, but what comes out of it, that was dumb. That wasn't so smart. Aren't you thankful that God's Word, even when our words and our actions feel useless, God can renew us uh, through the gift of His Word? Now, what's he talking about here, this idea of um, bottles in the smoke? What, what's that a picture of? The psalmist, from everything I could read and unpack on this verse, it's almost as if he's saying he's a dried, cracked, worn, and useless leather kind of wineskin or bottle um, that's been just kind of hanging by the fire and it's dried out and it's, it's cracked and it's been rendered useless. It's of no uh, value moving forward. And the psalmist feels as if he has reached this status of uselessness. And yet he turns to God's word and he's reminded that God can renew him even when he feels that he is useless and his efforts are futile. Just a thought tonight, maybe that would encourage you. I just know that this book does not return void, right? We know that. It accomplishes whatever God wants. So if I can stay connected to this book, that means my life is not useless. If I can teach it to somebody, if I can counsel somebody, if I can encourage someone, if I can just live it out before my kids on this Father's Day, my life, no matter how it feels, is not useless. The Word of God is powerful, it's, it's alive, it's eternal, and so we remember God's renewing Word as we struggle with the feeling of being useless or not significant or not being used by the Lord. And so allow God to renew you uh, through His Word. Uh, my father-in-law is here tonight, and we have several other retired pastors that are part of our church off and on when they're not traveling and preaching. And I will tell you, one of the most encouraging groups of people on the planet are men who've served in ministry of the Word for years, and they're still doing it. They'll do it with anyone wise enough to give them an opportunity. They'll teach, they'll counsel, they'll mentor, they'll preach. They've connected their lives to the Word. They may not fulfill the office, but they still have a gift and a calling, and it's connected to this book. You can be used by God. Be faithful to the Word of God. Let it renew you, uh, or maybe that is waning. All right, go down to verse 88. We'll come back to the interluding verses in a moment. The psalmist says this, quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. Lastly, in this first section, rely upon the companionship of God's tender word. Rely upon, <laughs> excuse me, the companionship of God's 
tender word. God is with us. He is with us in loving kindness. He is the one who is sustaining us. How does he do that? He does that through his word. I don't know about you, but life is not always easy, is it? Um, At times, life feels a bit unbearable. And I'm thankful for the word of God that gives to us God's light and God's presence and God's power and God's perspective in this this companionship that we have when we have the Word of God. And so he reminds us these two companions in this last verse of this first stanza, uh, the companionship of God, He is with us to bring us home, His love. He talks about His loving kindness and then His testimonies, His Word. So He's with us in love, He's with us in His Word. Um, I was joking with somebody about this the other day. If you notice that we, we have books that we haven't read in our house somewhere, and then, oh, like maybe today with West Coast being here, hey, there's a good book, and you bought another book, and you haven't read the other books that you have. Have you noticed we do that? It's almost like if we buy the book, it's just by osmosis. I've got lots of books. And people ask me sometimes, hey, is that a good book? It's in my office. I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> you know if I'm being honest, or hmm, I'm, I don't know, you know, <laughs> kind of being mysterious instead of admitting I haven't read it. But it's funny how we sometimes want to absorb things by osmosis. Um, This term has the idea of a gradual or an unconscious assimilation of ideas, knowledge, etc. You can't get that from God without His Word. It's not like there's like this mystical mountaintop or this this place that we go or this moment with God and and we feel His presence. It's always connected to His Word. And you're as close to God as you are to His Word. Draw nigh to His Word and God will draw nigh to you. And so lean into that companionship that we find in His Word. All right, so this word of application, we'll move to the second aspect of this first stanza. The sustaining everything that is found in God's word does not come into your life automatically or by osmosis, as we just said. You have to work for it. You have to mine it out of his word. Don't blame God for not meeting your needs when you have not put in the effort that's needed. Pursue his sustenance. If you feel weak, you feel depleted tonight, Lean into His Word. Seek Him until He gives you that strength, until He gives you that clarity, until He gives you that peace. Seek Him. And if you seek Him, God says you will find Him. All right, go back to verse 84. And let's spend a few minutes in these verses that precede verse 88 that we just skipped over. Number two, jot this down. So be biblical first with pursued sustenance. Are you pursuing God's sustaining provision in your life? Number two, be biblical with need meeting sustenance. He not only wants us to pursue it, number two, it is a need-meeting sustenance. Um, I don't know if any of you shop at Aldi or not. You know, we're catty corner to them. This is, we're not getting any, you know, like sponsorship monies right now because I bring this up in, in our service, but most of us at times swing by there maybe before or after church or whatever the case may be. Um, and if you notice, I, they still have the quarter thing in the, in the shopping carts. Any of you ever been out of a quarter? and you had a few things to get at Aldi? Do you know where I'm going with this? I've been in there, uh, and I just, you know, a lot of the guys my age and younger, sorry for those of you ahead of us, we just rarely have cash on us. That's an issue of our generation. I mean, I'm talking even a quarter. Sometimes we don't have a quarter. So you're like, you know what? I think I can get this. So you go into Aldi, you know, and you just start loading up, you know, and then you start, you know, kind of almost, you know, you're squatting down trying to get to the conveyor belt, and then there's a line, and you're, you know, laying a few things on a pallet next to the checkout, and you you work there. Have you been there? Is this just me? Um, so that's one funny thing about shopping. The other thing, a friend of mine the other day, his wife was talking about, um, she said, confession time. The prideful way I get when I give someone my Aldi cart when I'm done and tell them they can keep the quarter. You would think I just donated a million dollars to charity. Like, it's just like, you can just have it. You know, just go ahead. No problem. It's all on me. 25 cents. It's all on me. And it's funny how we, we meet needs of others and sometimes inconsequential ways, and we think we're so uh, impressive. Can I tell you this tonight? God gets glory from meeting our needs, but they also meet our needs. Like what he provides is what we need. Like God's word is not a gimmick. It's not just a show. It's substantive. It does meet the core uh, desperate needs that we all have uh, before him. All right, look at verse 84. How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them? that persecute me. Number one, jot this down, endure lengthy persecution with God's, excuse me, promised judgments. Endure lengthy persecution with God's promised 
judgments? How do we get through lengthy, difficult seasons? We do so through God's promises. And the question he asked in verse 84, how many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? It's as if he's saying, God, I've been waiting, and I've been waiting, and you've yet to follow through. If you flip it around to more of a declarative statement, he is saying, I've suffered enough. I've endured enough. I want you, God, to do something now. Step in. So we see him asking God to do something during this long waiting period. Now, don't miss the critical point of this verse. Notice he is not taking the matter into his own hands, is he? Romans 12, 19, vengeance is still the Lord's. He, he was waiting upon the Lord. He didn't want to take it into his own hands, but he saw in God's word promises of his intervention, and he stayed in God's word until God resolved the issues. Um, I know for me, there have been seasons I've gone through, and maybe you're there tonight or you've been there, where someone has wronged you. You've been wronged on a regular basis. I'm not talking an abusive type of situation. I'm just talking about something at work or something maybe in the church setting. It's not even the same person all of the time, but the same issue. In my, in my life, wrong that's not resolved, I can't have the right spirit for the long haul unless I'm in the Word of God. Okay, God, you said you'd take care of this. You said you'd deal with this, and so I'm just going to trust you. If I'm not in the Word, bitterness gets in here. Resentment, judgmentalism, uh, pushing against those things, trying to resolve it on my own. And so only with the Word of God can we patiently and properly uh, deal with and process the unresolved wrong that's in all of our lives. And so endure the persecution by leaning into God's promises. And their judgments. He'll judge, he'll deal with it, he'll do it in his time and in his way. All right, verse 85. The proud have dig pits for me which are not after thy law. Number two, avoid the traps of the proud by adhering to God's law. Avoid the traps of the proud by adhering to God's law. And so we see that he's dealing with these arrogant ones. They're, they're tracking him like an animal. They're putting pits in front of him and as they sought to ensnare him, he stayed focused on the word of God. And it's interesting in verse 85, it says they have digged pits, plural. It wasn't just a one-time attempt to trip him up. It was over and over and over. And he had to stay in God's word to navigate and to avoid those traps that God had put before him, or that they had put before him. Um, the other night, a few weeks ago, we had a stump the pastor night at our church, and the, the kids' choir, they had all these questions for me. And I told them, I said, this will be very easy for you to stump me. And they were just, I mean, they were just stoked to stump and corner the pastor. And uh, just to give you a sampling of some of the questions they asked me, one was, how many verses are in the Bible? I'm like, come on, guys, how many verses total, like exact verses? And then this one, and I, I got within, I think, maybe... 50,000 or so, how many verses that came to mind, um, was this, how many animals were killed in the flood? I'm like, come on, guys, how many animals were killed in the flood? And they were so proud of that question. I said, you, you've stumped me. You, you got me with that one. But just being trapped, being cornered. Um, when the prideful attack, we are to walk before the Lord in his word. I know for me, it's not even what someone does to me when they're, wrong, when they're wronging me. It's their attitude. You struggle with that? They think they're right, and they think they're, that I deserve it or whatever, and, and it, it, we struggle as much with their attitude or their ignorance or their denial of the wrong as the actual wrong that's being done. And so we process that <laughs> by adhering to God's Word, staying close to the Word of God, staying close to the Word of God. Think of this kind of sequence of thought. If the traps of the proud are the antithesis of God's Word, then my humble adherence to the word helps me to avoid them. Does that make sense? So if God's word and the traps are on opposite, going in opposite directions, then the best way for me to avoid the trap is not to say no trap, no trap, and how do I avoid it? It's to stay focused on the word of God. And as I do so, that helps me to avoid these things that otherwise would trip me up. And so avoid the traps of the proud by adhering to God's law. All right, next, go to verse 86. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. Number three, accept God's faithful help in the face of dishonesty. Accept God's faithful help in the face of dishonesty. And so in the midst of the things they were saying, um, the things that they were accusing, the wrongfulness of what they were doing, um, the psalmist accepted God's faithfulness. He let God be the one who helped him. 
Um, I was thinking about this. I don't know if this resonates with you, but how do we he- tell God, help me? Like, how do we say to God, help me? I think one of the best ways to say, God, help me, is to just open the book. Just by opening it, that's saying to God, I need your help. I need your clarity. I need your direction. I need your help for stuff I don't even know is going to happen today. And, and so opening the word is a cry for help. Regularly do it. Let God give you his help in the face of dishonesty. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Is the Lord your helper? He is if you're in his word. All right, verse 87, lastly in this stanza, we'll move to our second one. They had almost consumed me upon earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Lastly, in this section, prevent being consumed by adhering to God's precepts. Prevent your life, your influence, your family from being uh, consumed by adhering to God's precepts. Um, I don't know if you've ever gotten to the place that we see here where he says, they had almost consumed me upon earth. Have you ever felt like you've just, I've got nothing left. I'm just at the end of myself. I'm at the end of my rope. That feeling needs to be processed with continued obedience uh, to God's word. Spurgeon, in reference to this verse, said this, if we stick to the precepts, we will be rescued by the promises. That's a great thought. If we stick with the precepts, what has God said I'm to do and to believe and to think and to say, if I will stick with his precepts, he will deliver on his promises. Our job is to adhere to what he has given to us. If God's word will never be destroyed, then we who have identified consistently with it, we also will not be destroyed. It will preserve us. I remember Brother Andrew, who is um, still undergoing treatment for cancer, and pray, if you will, for Danny Weiss. I meant to mention that earlier. He begins treatments tomorrow. Um, God's been taking many in our church through valleys recently. But to Andrew, I remember one of the things he and I talked about is he was, especially those first few nights where Mandy would have to go home. You know, that was in the, 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 the flux of COVID and a lot of restrictions with that. And she would go home at least in the evenings with the kids and just those lonely nights. Remember that, Andrew, you talking about that. And just he said how precious God's word became to him in that season. Don't know where this is going, the diagnosis, the treatment. I'm all alone in a hospital in Canton and then in Cleveland. But God's word became precious to him. And I think many of us, the reason that God's word is not what it should be is because we don't lean into it, especially in good times, and then we're not ready when the difficult times come. Prevent being consumed. Prevent your faith being consumed by staying faithfully uh, in the word of God. If the default move is not first in your life to turn to the word of God, when you're in a difficult situation, something's off between you and the Lord. Ask God to change that by daily being in his word. All right, let's go then to stanza Lamed, the next um, Hebrew word or letter here in these verses that follow. Number two, let's spend a few minutes talking about the celebrated eternality or the enduring qualities of the word of God. Um, any of you remember ancient literature in some class? Uh, I remember like Beowulf. I don't know if that brings back just that, brings back, you cringe as you think about some paper you had to do on this ancient uh, piece of literature, um, or whatever the case may be, but aren't you thankful for the Word of God that it just endures? It's timeless. It just amazes me um, that, that it still is relevant. It still is powerful. So the eternality of the Word of God. And all of the Word of God has been stressing that it is the Word and it is eternal, but this stanza Lamed seems to take this to new heights, this significance of the, the enduring qualities of exclusively the Word of God. All right, two things under that. Number one, be biblical with, jot this down, dependable eternality. It is dependable uh, because it is eternal. Um, Little Jonah um, Studer uh, gave me this picture. I think this was after church last Sunday night, and this is a tremendous piece of art here, but this is of me. So he drew a picture of me. I think this was last Sunday night, and... uh, it looks like I got a little more hair than probably actually I do, so that's a win. Uh, and you can see my glasses there, but I don't know if his mom labeled it, but on the top you see pastor and arrow. And then you see the second one, this is what warmed my heart, where the scribbling is, Bible. Bible. I like that he picked up on that. I don't know what he thinks I'm reading from or what I'm referring to, but the fact he knew that it was a Bible. Is that, 
Is that where we look? Is that where we focus? Is that where we get what is the source of what is dependable? Uh, we need that in our day. All right, let's talk about a few things as, as it relates to this dependability. Verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Number one, rest in the heavenly sureness, sureness of God's word. It is heavenly uh, in its source and in its stability. Rest in the heavenly sureness of God's word. Um, I think we live in a day where faith is often viewed as a, it's almost like it's a, it's a step into the darkness. It's a leap of faith. We often use that expression. That it, there's nothing more antithetical to the word of God than that principle. Faith is not a leap into the dark. It's based upon the surest thing in the entire universe, the forever settled in heaven word of God. Um, that's amazing to me that we can believe in something that is as firm and fixed as heaven itself. God's word, unlike all others, is not subject to the corruption of this earth with all of its fickleness and its shortcomings. It rests upon the eternal, unchanging foundation of heaven itself. And you may want to jot down this statement. Luther was once quoted as saying this, the Bible is not antique or modern, it is eternal. And that's where we get off with the word of God. It's not antique and it's not modern. It's, it's just, it is. Just like I am, that I am, also the word of God is eternal. It's always been. It always will be. It's as eternal and lasting as uh, heaven itself. And so this beautiful gift that God has given us of the Bible, uh, it is sure. It is consistent. All right, number two. Look, if you will, verse 90. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. Number two. Believe in, believe in the every generation faithfulness and preservation of God. Believe in the every generation faithfulness and preservation of God. The psalmist here connects the forever nature of God's word to God himself, his faithfulness to all generations, and then he connects it further to his creation. Um, how did we talked about things that are eternal? The, the, the earth and everything in it has not always been. What started that? What aspect of God, his activity or his character launched creation? It was what? His word. And so the Word of God, it, it was at the beginning, it was at the dawn of, of everything that we, we, we sit on tonight and we look at and we, we process around us. Everything that's tangible from God issues from this book. It, it precedes, it predates all of that. And yet we often get distracted by the trends and the, we look at our young people and other scenarios and we're concerned. You know, our faith rests upon the eternal Word of God. Believe in that which is God's eternal faithfulness. God is dependable because God is dependable and because the earth is permanent in the sense it rests upon God's foundation, we can trust in his faithfulness. All right, verse 91, they continue these things that he has created. They continue this day according to thine ordinances for all are thy servants. This is a great verse. Number three, remember that all of creation serves under the ordinances, ordinances of God. Um, heaven and earth and everything in them obey God's commands. Um, if you think about it, seed time and harvest, right? I mean, just the rhythm, the cycles, the, the heat, the cold, the summer, the winter, the day, the night, the list goes on and on. They all serve God. Um, and they all serve the God who has given us this book. Um, one author said this, both great things and small things pay homage to the Lord. And I love this statement. No Adam, no Adam escapes his rule. No world avoids his government. God uh, is over all. And I was kind of processing this text in prep for tonight uh, a week or so ago, and I was just sitting in my office at home, and I have, we're in town, we own a very big lot, but we have some big pine trees out back. And the sun was just coming up, it's probably like 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'd already been fasting for several hours and run several laps around the, the subdivision, several miles under my belt by that point. But anyway, I was just amazed as the sun was coming up, birds are chirping, squirrels are going everywhere, and I had the windows open. It was still cool at that point. And just thinking, all of this movement and all of this noise and all of these things I, that my senses are processing, God told this to happen today. Like, that's how intricately involved he is in your life and mine, your world and mine. And it all comes back to, and it all orbits around the ordinances or the word of God. It's that uh, consistent. 
And I don't know about you, I can't remember the last time I got up and said, huh, there's the sun today. I can't believe it. It happened. We, like, don't we count on God's faithfulness in so many other areas? Maybe there's been a few seasons that we haven't seen the sun for a while with rain or whatever, but we're not shocked by, hey, look at it. Look, my lungs are working today. Like we just, we take for granted there's oxygen in this room tonight. Um, it's maybe not as cool or as warm as you want right now. I don't know. But we just take so much for granted. And then we come to these deeper, richer things. And we, it's like we can't trust God with those things. Remember that all of creation serves under the ordinances of God. That's the God that you follow. That's the God that's given you uh, his word. All right, verse 96. We'll come back to these couple of verses we're skipping in a moment. I've seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Lastly, in this area, discover that God's word goes beyond perfection. Discover that God's word goes beyond perfection. Um, it's amazing to me, is it not to you, how many of the best things in this world, this has five stars, and then you go and travel and see that place, or you go experience that thing, or you meet that person, or you read that book, or whatever, and the best of human achievement, you're still like, eh, that part I didn't like, or that wasn't as great as I thought it would be. Not true of our God. He goes beyond perfection. He is infinite. His word, therefore, that reflects his character, it is perfect. It's beyond the perfection we can ever see uh, in this life. And so we see clearly that it is worth our faith. It is worth our confidence. It's almost like this is juxtaposed against the book of Ecclesiastes, you know, where he keeps talking about it's all vanity. And then I went and pursued this and read this and thought this would, be, uh, would give me satisfaction. At the end of it all, he says it's all vanity. And here we see we find that which is perfect, that which will not disappoint, which is uh, the Word of God. And so may we lean into it and expect it to give to us God's perfection. Can I give you kind of this final takeaway, and then we'll move to our last point tonight. Um, I think a lot of us, we go one way or the other on this when we're not in step with the Word of God. We're prone to one extreme or to the other. Can I give you those two options and then maybe ask yourself which way you lean? and how the Word can help you. Some of us are prone tonight to go into a panic when preferences or traditions or just what we're used to changes. We, we, we get really uneasy with that. Um, and sometimes in a way that's not being faithful to the faith, but just kind of our own take on things. And then other of us may lean toward grasping for every new promising fad or, hey, this is going to do something for our family or our church or whatever the case may be, and, and we, we lean that way instead. So either holding on to things or grasping for new things that maybe God is not completely or entirely in. And I think if we have a proneness toward one of those directions, where we do, it exposes that we are not in that area depending upon the only thing in our lives that is eternally promising, and that is the Word of God. I know some of you probably you have to work through this regularly in our church. All I care about is what does the Word of God say? What has the Spirit led us to do? And that goes both directions in those two areas of proneness in each of our hearts and lives. But is the Word of God what we depend upon? Is it what we look to as the reference point for God's will and purpose? And so we must uh, be willing to be biblical with dependability uh, upon the Word of God. All right, then lastly, go to verse 92. Let's spend the balance of our time in these few verses that are left. Unless thy law had been my delight, I should then have perished in my affliction. Mine affliction. Lastly, jot this down. And secondly, be biblical with life-giving eternality. So God's eternal qualities are something we need to depend upon. Number two, there's something we need to look to for life. We need to look to for life. Um, Heidi and I, on Monday, the boys were at camp, and so we uh, went up to uh, Avon Lake. There's a park there right off of Lake Erie, and we spent um, the late morning, early afternoon there. It was a bit brisk and cool that day, um, as it is even in a, a hot day if you're along the lake. But we were just sitting there, and Heidi said, you know, what kind of fish are out there? And I'm not much of an outdoors person. You know, that's not necessarily my thing in some ways. I fished growing up and things, but I was just with good old faithful Google, I was just looking at, you know, what fish are out there? And they, and they were talking about what fish were in the lake and, and some of the details, and they were talking specifically about walleye and the fact that that's one of the primary fish you can get out of Lake Erie. But they made a statement. They said you only should eat it 52 times a year. And I was just reading a few articles. You're only supposed to eat it. Do you guys know this? Some of you, that's why it explains a few things for some of you. 
Um, but you're only supposed to eat it once a week um, because of some of the chemicals and pollutants that are still in the lake. There's nothing illegal about eating it more than once a week, but they advise you not to. And some of you remember back in the day when some of the rivers, you know, would catch on fire. And they said specifically one of the issues with Lake Erie that, Lake Erie that keeps persisting is that a lot of those pollutants, that though we've treated a lot of it, have got all the way to the bed rock of the, of the lake. The sun never hits it. And so they said it's going to take still several years before you can eat as much fish as you want out of Lake Erie. That's at least the advisement. And, and so it was just interesting reading on that there and processing that. And I was thinking about the, the provision of our God. Aren't you thankful that we don't have to just feed on it? Like, man, if I eat too much of this or I read too much of this, I'm going to get kooky or I'm going to you know, go crazy. You can't. Listen, you cannot ingest too much of the Word of God because it's life-giving. You want to feel more alive? You want to be more alive? You want to live more for the Lord? Be more in the Word. Don't avoid it to have life. Lean into it. And so it's, it's life-giving. It's eternally giving uh, the Word of God. All right, a couple things about that. We just read verse 92. Jot this down first. Delight your way through affliction with God's Word. Verse 92, unless thy law had been my delights, I should have, <laughs> excuse me, perished in mine affliction. Delight your way through affliction with God's word. Um, it's almost as if the psalmist is saying here that God's word brought a smile to his face when it seemed most illogical. He just, he just starts smiling, just thinking about and savoring what God had done for him. I think also this is obviously a psalm he may have sang some of these truths to the Lord, and he was just celebrating and savoring and smiling over what God had provided for him. In what context? Within the context of affliction. And had not God's word held this precious place in his heart, he no doubt would have perished in his affliction. That's what he's alluding to there in verse 92. And so we need to delight in God's word. You and I cannot make it in this world that's so plagued with heartache and death and disappointment and nothing goes as we had planned. Our expectations are not realized in some area. We can only make it through a world with that when we delight in the Word of God. And the, that's why we have so many sour Christians, quote-unquote, believers, so many faithless Christians is they're going through life and it just keeps piling on and on and they're not in the Word of God. And when you and I have that tendency... The same is true of us. Delight your way through affliction uh, with the Word of God. All right, verse 93, a couple verses and we're done. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. Here's this idea of making alive. Number two, determine to remember God's quickening precepts. Determine, he says, I will, I will never forget. Determine to remember God's quickening precepts. Um, I don't know about you, when I'm in pain, the last thing that comes to mind naturally is Scripture, at least if I'm not in the right frame of mind, right? Well, amen. Just, just ding my hand with my thumb with that hammer. Not the first time, it was the second time. That's when I really get to the point, I don't want Scripture, I want some other words, you know, or some other sentiments to be expressed. It's amazing how in pain, uh, we don't naturally lean toward the Word of God. We, we must determine, we must choose in the midst of the struggle uh, to lean into and to remember God's Word. He thought about it. He obeyed it. He would not forget it even when difficult moments came to him. Why? Because he knew that from them he would have life. I know for me that when I've been in a dry season or a painful season or just I don't know where this is going season, nothing breathes life into my soul and into my marriage and into our home and into our church more than just going back to this. Because it's not, it's not contingent on subjective moods and whims and circumstances, it's fixed. And it just, okay, God, you're still on your throne, and you're still good, and you're getting glory, and this is going to bring you glory, and this is going to be for my good. Determine to remember God's quickening precepts. It will reinvigorate you. It will revive you. It will renew you, whether the circumstances change or not. In fact, I'll give you the verses if you want to jot them down. You can look at them in your own time again. But verse 25, verse 37, these are all verses that speak to the life-giving power of the Word. Verse 25, verse 37, verse 40, verse 50. 25, 37, 40, 50, verse 88, verse 107, verse 149, 107, 149, 154, 
156 and 159, 149, 154, 156, 159. All of those verses throughout this this psalm speak of the life-giving power of the Word of God, and it's prominent in the thematic structure of this psalm. It should therefore be prominent in our lives as well. Um, I know for me, sometimes I forget that I don't know God, I don't have eternal life without this book, right? We only have life through this book. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, and we were born again. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which what? Liveth and abideth forever. And our life rests upon it. So determine to remember what quickens us, that is, the precepts of God. All right, two more and we're done. Look at verse 94. I am thine, he says, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. Allow God, here it is, number three, allow God to own you with his saving precepts. Allow him to own you, to own you with his saving precepts. Even after we've been saved from the penalty of sin, we still need to be saved day by day from defilement, from damage. Kind of the idea of Peter, remember he says, wash me all over uh, in the, uh, the foot washing ceremony. And Christ said, you've already been washed in that sense. You just need your feet clean. That's the idea here, this saving, this cleansing from the day-to-day defilement and damage that comes from living in a fallen world. God saves us. God uh, renews us where we have uh, that need. And so by acquainting ourselves and being familiar with God's precepts and keeping it close in our hearts, it allows us to experience this present tense, this ongoing reality of being saved by God himself. And so allow God to own you with his saving precepts. All right, lastly, verse 95, the wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. This is probably one of my favorite verses in this stanza. This last statement, depend on God's word to protect you from the waiting of the wicked. Depend on God's word to protect you from the waiting of the wicked. Um, Because it's Father's Day, I think I can get away with this, even though my wife is in here tonight. But if you guys noticed, we were in a, um, we were up in uh, near Lake Erie and she conveniently forgot her coat and a blanket. So we had to go buy a blanket. So we went to Lake Erie and ended up in home goods shopping. I'm like, what happened here? You know, I think it was part of her plan. But anyway, in the center of that store was like 35 aisles of pillows. Have you noticed the obsession of you ladies? You, let's admit it, okay? Tonight, you ladies with pillows, some of you at least. The other day, a guy that, that I know a little bit, he said this. Here was his, his, his thought on pillows. He said, quote, this is him quoting women everywhere. This was his, his sense. Let's stack these 47 pillows on the bed every morning, throw them on the floor every night, and repeat that every day for no reason at all. Let's just do that over and over. Um, do, you, do you sense sometimes that we do things that, I know I just got myself in trouble, okay? We only have, I think we have seven. We have six or seven on our bed, okay? So we're a little better than these, these ladies. But it, it, it's funny to me how we, we know something's coming, and sometimes the anticipation of that, or knowing someone's waiting for us to do us in, and we, we stress on that, and we chew on that, and we resent that in some way. And the way to process those who are waiting to undo us, the wicked have waited for me to destroy me. What does he do? He says, but I will consider thy testimonies. Now, this is key. We often live in a reactionary mode. What's the deal with the pillows, as we would say, as I just talked about, or some other issue, instead of living in response and in relationship with the Word of God? In one sense, who cares what the wicked? Let the heathen rage. Let the heathen rage. My God wrote a book for me to dig into. What he says matters than what, more than what they say. And, and where he's taking this matters more than where they think they want to take things. And so the focus stayed upon the word, even in the midst of those who were waiting, not just to inconvenience him or to frustrate him, but to kill him. And so may we be willing in the midst of our lives as we seek to live for the Lord, may we keep our focus upon the Lord. Um, Spurgeon, again, paints a beautiful picture of what verse 95 is telling us. He says, They, the wicked, were like wild beasts crouching by the way, or highwaymen way, waylaying a defenseless traveler, but the psalmist went on his way without considering them. Why? For he was considering something better, namely the witness or the testimony which God had borne to the sons of men. He did not allow the malice of the wicked to take him off from his holy study of the divine word. He concludes with this thought, if the enemy cannot cause us to withdraw our thoughts from holy study 
or our feet from holy walking, or our hearts from holy aspirations, he has met with poor success in all his assaults. And we have allowed the enemy to get us off by just getting us out of this book. We're talking about them and conspiracies that relate to them. We're getting all worked up about these things. And the psalmist here says, I'm not giving a second thought to that. I'm just keeping my heart and mind uh, in your word. So may we be willing to depend upon God's word to protect us from those who wait to undo us. Where do you turn to get your life back? Where do you, tend, where do you go for renewal and endurance and perseverance? There's nowhere, nowhere more wise for the believer to turn than the living, the ever-living Word of God. I was reading this the other day, and I think this brings this to application tonight. Um, president Polk would have been the president when what we call the gold rush happened. And uh, obviously the gold that we just talked about a moment ago had great value in that day as it does in our day. And uh, President Polk actually went so far as to encourage Americans to go there. He knew that if we could, if we could get to the other coast and we could um, develop and conquer the land, if you will, that that would lead to the expansion of our, our country and all that goes with that. And there was a specific paragraph that jumped out at me. I've never thought of this before. It says, within months, thousands of young men answered his call, this call from our president, President Polk. They traveled over land by horse or even sailed around South America in tall ships. Men flooded into North California through a small fishing village known at the time as San Francisco. More than 12, listen to this, these are the, the quantified results of that massive shift of human population. More than 12 billion tons of earth will be moved, were moved in the gold exploration. Listen to this reducing the depth of San Francisco Bay by three feet after rivers wash silt into that body of water. The massive movement of land and soil just to try to find gold. We, we are so easily distracted from this book. We're not, we don't have the sustenance and the life-giving, eternal, breathing kind of power of God in our lives because we're not giving the effort needed to find it, to mine it out. It's right there, guys. It's right there. But we're not giving ourselves to it as we should, starting with me. We have to dig into it. We have to exert the effort, move, if you will, some things to make it the priority in our lives. So this kind of closing thought tonight, you can search the world over with your little pan and find whatever promising gold treasures and trinkets that the world offers, or you can find real treasure, enduring treasure, eternal treasure in the Word of God. And here would just be my question as we finish. What would happen if we really would give ourselves to seeking it? What kind of sustenance could we have tonight? Not just for us, but to help others and refresh and minister to others. What kind of life could we be living if we would give ourselves to the Word of God? Will you tonight choose to join the psalmist in celebrating the Word of God that alone brings supernatural sustenance and supernatural eternality? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Word tonight.